Welcome everybody. Um, very glad to see you this morning. And I am so thrilled to have uh, Jonas with us, who is a friend and colleague of Melinda in Massachusetts. And, um, uh, and Jonas gave us an experience of, of exploring wisdom, uh, one of my favorite subjects. And um, so I'm, I'm very thrilled. And I think I'm gonna turn it right over to Melinda to introduce Jonah because it's such a rich program ahead of us today. Mm. Inside, I have to say I'm really excited and I'm really, um, I'm really grateful and I have a lot of um, gratitude for everybody here and, and for Jonas who's joining us. Um, as I get older, I think I'm starting to realize that um, one of my passions is, is connecting and sort of living more of a coherent life. And so here, you know, I, I do this professionally, but it's part of who I am. And then I have my life here in Village Hill in Northampton and um, trying to find ways to be, for it to all make sense and to be coherent and that I can be fully myself. And sort of by having Jonas inviting him, who's my neighbor, who also has a, um, the Empty Bell, a contemplative sanctuary um, that I've been sort of participating in monthly in a monthly meditation group somehow just sort of connecting all the dots um, is really meaningful to me. And so I'm really grateful that you all showed up today and that we're going to experience um, the presence of Jonas. You know, there's certain people in your life where you just feel like you're just with them and you don't have to say anything. And that's sort of how I feel with Jonas. Um, I just, every time I connect with him, we don't need words or some heart connection. And, and so I just wanted to share him with you today. So I can go into all his, you know, his, um, you know, th that he's a director of the Empty Bell and he's an author, he's a musician, he's a retreat leader, but he's, he's just so much more that, that I, I just can't even put it in words. So I'm just going to let uh, Jonas take over. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see you this morning. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. It was great to see you all. Um... I, even though Zoom is a, a, di a digital format, I, when I look into your faces, I get, just get a sense of who you are, and uh, I become more who I am as I gaze into your eyes. And uh, I think faces are really important. We convey our spirit through our faces and through our bodies uh, and through what we do and through how we speak. Um, so I'm happy to be here. I don't know exactly what I'm going to be doing today um, because I am a, if you know the Myers-Briggs, uh, I'm a P on the Myers-Briggs and I kind of um, get in the canoe and I see where, I, where the river takes me. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Um, it's always works for me. So uh, anyway, I, so I'll say, if, I'm gonna say a few words about wisdom, but I think the wisest thing that I can do today is to uh, help with you to create a space where we can reflect together on wisdom. Um, Melinda mentioned being ourselves and you know that saying that, uh, uh, go it, please uh, be yourself because all the others are taken. Um, so I think that's wise advice. And um, so if we bring awareness to our breathing right now, um, it's always a good place to start. In the Abrahamic traditions, you know, spirit is ruach, the breath of God. Um, every breath is a gift. We didn't make up breathing. We didn't come out of our mothers and say, okay, now I'm going to invent breath. Uh, we breathed and, and we were alive and we are alive. And this breath keeps coming, breathing in, and breathing out. It's like the tides coming in and coming out, um, governed by magnificent, limitless forces over which we have no control. Breathing in and breathing out, being present. I noticed this morning a, uh, one of my favorite Rumi poems, probably because I could have gotten more sleep than I, than I actually did, but you, you, you may know this Rumi poem. Um, the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must, must ask 
or what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where their two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. So being awake is um, a deep calling that some of us have noticed to be awake. There's so many forces in this world now to draw us out of ourselves, to put us back to sleep into distraction or fear. Don't go back to sleep. And we have to want it. We have to hear that call and really want it. I'm not going to go back to sleep no matter what. I'm not going to go back to sleep when I'm afraid. I'm not going to go back to sleep when death approaches or the death of a loved one or the danger of war. I'm not going to go back to sleep. It's a deep, honorable dedication and commitment. And as we're breathing, uh, listening inwardly, uh, Linda mentioned uh, the Empty Bell Retreat Center, which is an inter-spiritual retreat center that I've been uh, hosting since 1993. And everyone who comes to the Empty Bell now on Zoom um, needs to read the Empty Bell Principles of Sharing. And what's central to that principles, those principles, is listening. What is listening, really listening? Uh, not just hearing, but listening. So when we are in a group like this, or any group, or a relationship, there's listening inwardly and listening outwardly. What's happening around me in this room I'm in? Uh, any sounds, smells, uh, windows, doors? Is anything else happening in this room? And just listening, uh, very simple, without making a narrative about it. And uh, this listening, I think. For me, this listening is holy. It's, it's holy, it's, it's beyond us. We're not just listening to our inner stories and our reactions, but we're listening without knowing exactly what we're listening for. And that for me is what being awake is all about. So we're just breathing. And I invite you to, um, if we pretend that this is an actual formal meditation, which might help you and might not help you, um, to notice if you're distracted right now by anything else. A memory, a plan for the rest of the day, um, a pain in your body, uh, a relationship problem you're facing. fear, just noticing. And you know, some of the, uh, the Buddhist teachers will say, it's like sitting on the side of a river, watching the thoughts and memories go by like boats on the river. And can we be that inwardly still that we can really see clearly the boats going by? Now, I, one difference I have with some of the Buddhist, Buddhist Vipassana teachers that I've had is um, not all thoughts are alike. Not, a boat, not all boats are alike. Um, that there are some, there's actually some boats I, I uh, invited to get on and go down river with that boat. There are some thoughts that occur to me that are actually blessed or holy thoughts or where I'm drawn closer to the divine. So I can't just uh, be neutral about thoughts. I have to really discern, is there something being, am I being called in this thought or this memory? Is there another step for me into the, the holy unknown? 
So that's what being awake is, being awake. Um, and we're talking about wisdom, I think. Um, people who are wise are awake. Um, and they, they don't go back to sleep. Even when we're sleeping, there are dreams. And the dreams um, sometimes are calling to us. And during the day, if you know that transition from sleeping to awakeness is sometimes so um, uh, fascinating uh, that there are, there are dreams that just begin to emerge before we awake that are in some ways uh, like a doorway into a truth about our, our awake life. So I'm, I've been very interested in that transition from sleep to awake. And there's also the sleep of uh, distraction and fear and worry. Um, when we're drawn into those experiences, we're not awake. But it's, it's also good not to deny that I'm afraid. I occasionally say, just so I can be awake, I occasionally admit to myself and will even say out loud, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, because anyone who is not afraid is not awake. It's a very dangerous situation to live um, when we know that we're going to lose the people that we love, the life that we love. We're all going to die. But that's not a that doesn't need to be a fear for me. It's a wake up. Wow, I I'm alive. There's this breath, this ruach. Ruah, this uh, Hagios Pneuma that is what the Christians uh, did with the language for, for holy breath. So life is, we're going to die and life is precious every moment. Um, so I wanted to, um, I was going to, I realized I told Melinda and Lynn that I would um, just say a little bit about myself um, before I, we have a little bit of a conversation. I, I, um, I don't know. I don't. I only know Melinda and Mitch. I don't think. Do I know anybody else? I don't think so. Well, I will know you by the end of this hour. <laughs> um, but I, I, um, I grew up in northern Wisconsin. Um, in 1947, my father was in World War II, and he came home and. Uh, married my mother and they had a baby and I was that baby. And I um, uh, grew up in the, my parents had a bar in Northern Wisconsin. That's one of the ways people survived is you have, you have alcohol and the Green Bay Packers and deer hunting and, um, and church on Sunday. Um, and I was raised Lutheran. My uh, grandparents were German Lutheran uh, and they spoke German around the house, especially when they didn't want the grandkids to know what they were talking about. And I, my grandmother taught me this prayer. Um, ich bin klein, mein Herz ist rein, niemand im Bonen aus Jesus allein. Does anybody know that, that, that prayer? Yeah, the German prayer. Very beautiful. I'm small, my heart is pure. No one lives in my heart but Jesus alone. And um, that prayer uh, saved my life because um, I got to know Jesus through my grandmother. Um, and my parents were um, descended into alcoholism and um, dom domestic abuse and uh, really rancorous divorce when I was uh, 11. And um, I was in trouble with the law. I was arrested for breaking and entering when I was 11. Um, the cop put me in a cell and said, this is where you're going to end up. And um, I sort of believed it, but I was really angry at him. And he put me in the magistrate's uh, 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 court, uh, sort of a, a, a room for hearings where all, there were steps for the chairs and um, put me in one of these chairs and he left the room and I went down to the judge's desk and stole a pair of sunglasses. And uh, so I was, I was really on a downhill slide. And, um, but 
I somehow was able to believe that there was a higher reality um, where love is is the way. Um, and I, I believe that. I took that to heart and got my life straightened out with the help of a lot of folks and um, went to Luther College to be a Lutheran minister in the 60s, uh, decided that God is dead because that was what Time Magazine said, God is dead. And uh, I believed it. Um, the war was going on and then I went to, um, I transferred to Dartmouth and majored in government so I could go into politics and save the world. And, uh, and then um, I, I don't need to get into too many details, but I, I do need to tell you that when I walked into Dartmouth College, into a, a alumni hall, um, I, I went up to the top floor on an old wood floor, made uh, a building made in the 19th century. And there were about 20 guys, that, because it was an all male college, um, in white uniforms called geese, and they were practicing Taekwondo karate and, um, and meditating. And I, I was, you know, totally fascinated. What is this? I'd never experienced anything Asian in, in my life. Um, but I asked to join and um, I joined up and I learned how to meditate in Chinese, Chinese Chan meditation and um, started thinking about Jesus again, because the teacher, the Chan teacher said, I want you to go out in the winter in Hanover, New Hampshire. It gets awfully cold, as you can imagine. And I we took, uh, took off our shoes. Well, we didn't wear shoes anyway, but go out into the snow and warm your feet with chi. So I um, tried that out and and um, emerged. My I still have feet and toes and everything. <laughs> and but I began to wonder: Did did Jesus work with chi energy, body energy, body spirit energy? And um, I got fascinated in that. And then I discovered Thomas Thomas Merton who was, you know, a Trappist, Christian Trappist monk who was friends with the Dalai Lama. And he navigated, he began to navigate that uh, Abrahamic Eastern wisdom into his Christian life. And that was the beginning for me. I started reading all of Thomas Merton's books. I ended up being a farmer and then I went to Harvard, got a doctorate in uh, object relations psychotherapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy. Went from there into being a therapist, then um, met Henry Nowen at Harvard, and we became friends. And then I, he, he counseled me about, what, should I get ordained? And what I did was I uh, started the Empty Bell Retreat Center in 1993 as a place that was institutionally free, free of any institution, uh, still having my basic Christian practice, feeling the presence in me, uh, in my practice in my presence, feeling another presence um, and wanting a place where I could talk about that openly with other people. So I began inviting uh, Buddhist and Christian monks and nuns to the empty bell and we would sit in quiet, in silence in the morning and then we would have lunch together and then we would um, have a conversation in the afternoon across the, the uh, apparent boundary between Abrahamic spirituality and Buddhism. And uh, I learned a tremendous amount. Um, and, and now I, um, I've been leading retreats mostly and writing books. Um, so uh, my wife is an Episcopal priest. She, uh, her bishop hired her to work full-time on climate change. So that's what she's doing. Um, she's preparing for another talk right now. Um, and um, so, uh, so that's my story. And maybe um, what I found uh, lately when, when I tell my story um, with folks who are about my age, I'm 75, um, folks in their 60s and 70s uh, have me memories that are ignited for, for others. Where, you know, where were you in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s? And uh, what touched you? Um, where did you find wisdom? Um, and how did you know what to look for? Um, and very many, many of us are feel this longing 
toward wisdom, even though we know we don't know exactly what it looks like, uh, or it could be like you know, Justice Potter once said uh, in the early '70s about pornography when he was asked to define pornography, he said, "I don't know what it is, but but, but I I know it when I see it." <laughs> Uh, and maybe maybe that's what wisdom is for you, that you, something clicks in you, you recognize wisdom. Um, and I'd be very curious to hear from you um, about what that is. What do you hear? What do you see when you're in the vicinity of wisdom? So I'm going to, I'm going to pause there. Um, I have many more things to share and this morning. <laughs> When I got up really early, I found so many wonderful poems uh, that point me in the direct of, uh, direction of wisdom. But I, I'm guessing that each of you is uh, uh, has something interesting to say. Uh, Melinda and Lynn, is it okay if we have a conversation a little bit here? Uh, oh, absolutely. We love that. <laughs> okay, great. Anyone like to uh, share share something? At, at the empty bell, we have these conversations and we, we've learned to, to be easy, to um, be comfortable with silence, mm -hmm. e even in a moment like this, when, you know, when I first started out with these kind of conversations, I would get a little nervous, like, oh, the silence is going on too long. Maybe I should do something. And, uh, you know, I don't do that anymore. It's like, I assume that the silence means that you're, you're reflecting. We have in, in focusing the idea of the, the pause that's so important, you know, to just go inside and then see what what wants to be said. Uh, and, and we always invite people, whatever is there for you is welcome. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say something. Um, Jonas, um, my name is Dorothy. Um, very, very touched by mm. your story, I'm very moved by it. Um, mm. I um, grew up as a fundamentalist um, Christian when my parents converted from one Catholicism and one Judaism to fundamental Christianity when I was three. Mm. And I remember walking down the aisle to be saved when I was 12 and sobbing and sobbing oh. and realized <laughs> later it had nothing to do with coming to Christ and just as I am without one plea and all that stuff. Yeah. And I realized later I was really um, asking for something deep to be seen. Um, mm -hmm. But everybody was so happy that I was saved. And <laughs> when you talked about Jesus, um, Jesus has always been a wisdom figure for me, even though I, you know, definitely turned away from the church at a pretty young age of that religion. Um, I always, it's like there was this little girl connection that I knew something that was very wise about Jesus. And so it, it just, it helped like reaffirm and reconnect with the wisdom of Jesus and the wisdom that, that he instilled in me, um, he, she. So thank you for that particular sharing among all of your sharings. Thank, thank you, Dorothy. I can really identify with that uh, walk down the aisle at 12 years old. And, yeah, and, um, and Jesus's wisdom um, makes sense to me too, because I mean, in the early tradition, well, you know, in the Judaic, in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, there's a book called Wisdom. Um, and wisdom is uh, Sophia. Sophia is a feminine um, archetype of wisdom, and many early Christians thought that they were they were so drawn to Jesus's the Jesus of Nazareth, the historical figure, so drawn to his wisdom that they thought he was an uh, incarnation of wis of Sophia, um, that he he was a a beautiful integration of male female um, spirit. Um, grew up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Je Jesus was a Jew. Let's you know, lots of Christians don't understand that. 
And uh, lots of Christians don't understand that Christ is not his last name. I mean, there's so many, there's so many um, um, unfortunate mistakes being made in really all the traditions right now. Um, but I feel like there's a revival going on. I really do. You know, that we're taking the best from these traditions. And it's become we're becoming new together. I see Gosha has something. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, Jonas, for what you've been saying. It touched me so you were asking about how do you recognize wisdom? And I felt immediately that whenever I met a teacher or a reading that was kind of speaking to me, I could recognize it like immediately. It was like uh, talking from heart to heart and I knew, and it was something like, oh, I knew it before. <laughs> it is kind of mine. Somebody else now it's saying it out loud or, 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 or writing it for me. wow. And I always felt so enthusiastic about it. Wow, <laughs> what a finding, what a treasure. But I knew that I knew it before. Yes. Like somebody was speaking it for me. Uh, yeah, so this was, this was, this was that, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and again about Jesus, as, as you've been talking with Dorothy, mm, uh, I'm always uh, struck by the similarities about focusing on this spirituality and especially with Jesus for me it's like he came to to show us that that this uh, relationship coming on this one to one is the most important then all the rules are uh, you know they are fundamental they 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 make us kind of oriented but then it's this moment between you and me and it's uh the most important what is flowing between us so thank you so much well, thank you uh, i normally don't comment after every person just so you know but it, this is so beautiful i uh i totally agree with you um that uh fundamental to my spiritual life is this this phrase i keep hearing this this uh, being addressed, and the and the uh, the sentence is, "I see you, I know you, and I love you." I see. I'm noticing you. I'm awake to you. I see you. I know you. I. Uh, this, this is God speaking, <laughs> by the way. Um, I I know everything about you. I know all the mistakes you made and the things you're ashamed of and the guilt and I know the joy you felt and the loss and the fear. I know. I know you, and I love you. So all those things that might get in your way as stumbling blocks to being awake and alive um, as you really are, 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 are dissolved in that love. And it's very personal, like you say. That, and uh, that's always interested me so much that for the last 15 years, I've been working on a book on the Holy Trinity, trying to understand what the heck is a Trinity, you know? And um, thinking the Nicene Creed was just like so, strange uh, and meaningless and so i went spelunking into the nicene creed and i went spelunking into what they were the ancient theologians were trying to talk about and what i discovered is that the um there are three dimensions to spiritual awareness um and i i've tried to live these for the last 15 years and you can ask my wife margaret uh, because i i would she would say something or i would say something and then i'd say Okay, now is that the first dimension or the second or the third? Where where are we here? And the second the second dimension of the Trinity is is the appearance in a person of the Creator, of whom we can say nothing about the Creator, who is beyond all of our thoughts and our narratives and our religions, everything. The Creator is total mystery. But the second person. I, that is Jesus, is the appearance of the creator in human form. And when I'm in I-thou relationship 
and think of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, you know, and he wrote a book called I and Thou, ich, ich und Dich, I and Thou. That I Thou relationship is fundamental to my spiritual life. The I love you. I, as far as I know, the Buddha did not say, Do you love me? Um, or I love you, as far as I know. Um, there, that's something really unique in the Abrahamic traditions. The I love you is a fundamental doorway into ultimate reality. So when I say I love you to someone, it's not just person to person. There's something elevated and transcendent about saying that. And it means I'm putting my life on the line. It doesn't mean I have to do everything for that person. It doesn't necessarily mean any particular behavior. It just means that I know I'm facing life and death when I say I love you because it's ultimate. Oh, dog. I see um, Shashi and then Joe. Well, we, can we pause just one oh, second? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, does that make sense? Uh, where did she go? <laughs> oh, there you are. I'm here. I didn't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. It makes a great sense, uh, and uh, I'm hearing, uh, like you know, uh, yeah. I'm I'm hearing a lot of stuff that I love around. Uh, I think CC and 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 James Finlay, Thomas Merton, Richard Rohr, Trinity, and all of that is really like. Yeah, the ocean I'm swimming for years, so I feel like, wow, thank you for, for being yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Did, Goshia, did, did, do you uh, come from the Orthodox tradition? Uh, no, I come from an Orthodox religion country, from Poland. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, my, my heart goes out to you the, and what's happening right next door. And yeah, now all, all the refugees in your country. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Shashi. I wanted to, um, I, I've been listening to you and I'm trying to understand what awake means and not going back to sleep, you know? Um, beyond all the descriptions and all the um, things that you have said in generic, um, in, in um, simple terms, what does that mean being awake, you know, um, in everyday life? Yes, yes. Thank you. Sashi, where, where are you speaking from? Are you in the U.S.? Or? I'm in New Jersey. Yes. <laughs> New Jersey, all right. <laughs> That's U.S. <laughs> yeah, there's, and uh, asking ultimate questions in New Jersey. This is great. Um, so I think um, the uh, Buddha was called the Awakened One. And yeah. I think in some translations that that's what the, uh, Buddha means, yeah. being awake. Did you ever see the movie, uh, The Little Buddha? Um, mm -hmm. keep Kino Reeves, some people have seen it. Kino Reeves plays Buddha. <laughs> and he's sitting, he's sitting under the tree. And um, I've been to that tree. I, I played Japanese bamboo flute and I played, it's called the Shakuhachi. I played Shakuhachi underneath the, um, the Bodhi tree. The Bodhi tree, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bodhi was tree. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so in the movie, um, Buddha says he's going to sit under that tree until he becomes awake. Mm -hmm. And he is absolutely committed. He's never going to get up until he wakes up. And he's sitting there. And, and in the movie, what happens is um, lots of fears and temptations come up. And uh, there's, there's danger and there's uh, um, the temptation of uh, greed and sexuality out of control and, and fear. And, and as, he's, as he sees all these things coming through his mind and his heart, he looks up and there's a hillside um, that is um, uh, small trees. And suddenly he sees uh, a, an army emerging over the hill. Mm -hmm. And this, these soldiers have bows and arrows that are on fire. Mm -hmm. 
There are thousands of them. And he's just, he's just sitting there, if you can imagine, just, you know, and he looks up. And suddenly they all release the arrows at once at him. All the arrows on fire are coming right toward him. And he can feel the fear come up, the fear of death, which we all have. We all touch that place. And they're coming, and when they get right close to him, they all dissolve into flowers. And the whole sky is falling flowers, this beautiful thing. Well, what is that? that that's a weakness, that we're facing the fear of death. We're facing the fear of, of woundedness and and loss and grief, everything. We're facing our deepest fears and by being awake to them and allowing them, even saying, I'm afraid, admitting our fear, the fear and the danger turns into beautiful flowers. That's the best example I can think of. Um, and I highly recommend that movie. Some of you have seen it. Now I want to watch it again. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that is one form of it, yes. Thank what's you. The, what's the name of the movie again? The Little Buddha. Oh, The Little Buddha. Okay. Put it in the chat. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you. There's just just uh, another movie that uh, portrays the Trinity in a very interesting way is The Shack where uh, God is a, is a black woman and the Holy Spirit is, uh, it, I won't describe it, but uh, if you're interested in sort of charming portrayal of the Trinity, it's, it's a lovely movie. Thank you, Lynn, yeah, the shack, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Joe, you? Uh, yes, I, <clears throat> just, just a comment. Um, your reference to the divine as love, or in the Christian terms, agape, um, leads to a wonderful and interesting uh, understanding, especially from a focusing perspective. As, as we know, the whole concept of interaction was fundamental to Gene Gentleman's thinking and, and his development of focusing. So if we step back and look at the divine as agape or love itself, the essence of love, if you look at that as interaction, then the Trinity really makes a lot of sense because you have the lover and the beloved. And in their interaction together, it gives rise to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you look at it that way, the Trinity becomes love, mm -hmm. an expression of love. Uh, between the lover, the beloved, and the spirit that, that arises out of their unity together. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's beautiful. It's really yeah. powerful. So that's all I wanted to say. No, thank you. Yeah, the, the lover, the beloved, and the love that flows between. And that's, that's a phrase that comes from uh, St. Augustine. Um, and I, I think that's, that's true. Now, I, I'd like to just add one more thing there. Um, so this book that I've been working on, on the Holy Trinity is called My Dear Far Nearness. And it, uh, Orbis is publishing it, it and it comes out in, um, uh, in May. Wow, it's almost May. Wow. Um, it, and my, I get the name My Dear Far Nearness from Marguerite Porret, um, a, midi, uh, a mystic, in the uh, fourth, uh, 14th century. And um, she, she went spelunking. I like this word spelunking, you know, this verb. It's when you, when, uh, cave explorers, they go down in. I, I really trust the darkness, um, the, the cloud of unknowing, the place, places I don't know, who, uh, where I don't know who I am. Um, I respect the unconscious. I respect the collective unconscious. I respect that truth and wisdom can be arising out of nowhere, out of that darkness. It's a holy darkness. And she, Marguerite Perret, uh, trusted that darkness. And she, she realized that 
I think I think she got this uh, uh, understanding of God from um, Irojena, who's a Celtic theologian. But that um, we are not God did not create us separate from God. God is not out there somewhere and then said, well, you know, now I'm going to create this planet Earth and all these people and everything. We are created from inside God. We are inside God. We're born already inside God. And we're inside God right now. So then she, we were talking about language before some of you came. How, what name do I want to use for ultimate love, ultimate reality? Um, because the the names I've been giving don't work very well anymore. Like I have a son who's 31. He can't, he has no understanding of the word God. Nothing. There's no reaction. Um, which at first was a grief to us, um, Margaret and me, but um, we began to understand that he's finding his own way and he's going to find his own language when he touches that ultimate place. Um, but her name for God was my dear far nearness. God is near and far. God is inside me and outside me. There's no, God has no location, <laughs> put it that way. God, God has no location, like GPS couldn't, cannot find God because there's no location. Um, we, that understanding has really transformed my life. That, um, um, so, the th but the thing is, it's it's dangerous to realize that that depth of wisdom, because folks who are attached to their view don't don't like don't like it when people fool around with their attached views. So what happened? Marguerite Poiret um, ran into trouble with the, uh, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, and um, <clears throat> she was killed. She was burned live at the stake in Paris in 1310. And to me, it's such a tragic story because the more I read her, The Mirror of Simple Souls, or I think was one of her books, I, I just, I sometimes cry when I talk about her because I, I sort of, I've fallen in love with her because her depth of love and wisdom is so beautiful. Um, and she was not afraid. Uh, she was brought before these trials and, and she affirmed that um, basically, you know, I'm inside God, you're inside God, we're inside God, and let's let's stop playing around with this, uh, trying to control this. So my dear far nearness is uh, um, a very holy name for me, and I, you know, bowing to Marguerite uh, for what she did. I wonder if you could put your book and Marguerite uh, in the chat for us. Oh, oh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. She being able to to find that. I'm working on the website for the book to mirror the book. Um, maybe I got the word mirror from mirror of simple souls. I, well, whatever. Yeah, there's a website now that's just coming on. It's called mydearfarnearness.org. And far, there's a little dash between far and near, far nearness like that. Yeah. Hi, can I, I just like to say something um, about wisdom. Um, you know, and thinking in terms of focusing and the people that have been in my life before me, people who are no longer with me. And when I think of wisdom or when I want, when I, I need to connect to wisdom, I go to some of those people like my mother, or my deceased husband. I, you know, I, they're with me. Yes. And that's also a great comfort to me. So through the focusing, I can get there. I can get to those places that are deep inside. You know, so. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful, that's beautiful. Our ancestors lived through us and um, gave us life. Um, you know, even if we have trouble with some of them, <clears throat> they were struggling too. Uh, it's it's hard to be human, <laughs> uh, but yeah, being gr being grateful for those that have given us life uh, is a beautiful thing. Hmm. I just wanted to say that I'm uh, resonating to to so much of what people are saying, and that uh, that 
experience of wisdom being something that you recognize, like, oh, yes, I know that deeply and how we're uh, implicitly connected to all of that. And it, it, it brings, it wakes up the wisdom in us when we experience it, you know, in other people. And I, and I wanted to say that uh, focusing and Buddhism brought me back to my love of Jesus that had been ruined for me uh, with the kind of uh, orthodoxy of, of the, the church when I was a young person in the mm. you know, late 60s. And um, we've, we, we have uh, had um, Jackie Lewis, the uh, pastor of um, Middle Collegiate Church that I belong to. She, she did a talk for us last year and she gave, gave a lovely sermon yesterday if anybody wants to, um, to, to look at uh, the idea of spirituality being love, just love. Uh, you might want to look that up. And um, I'm just appreciating everything that everybody's saying here this morning. <laughs> I'm Leslie from Cape Town, and um, I just was thinking uh, my own journey was through Catholicism as a child, and uh, it really wasn't good. I really had not a good experience at the hands of nuns and was left, you know, given a lot of shame. But I had to leave that school and go to another school for various reasons, and um, I became very wild. But one of the things that really hurt, what I think, for me was poetry and I, was, I started reading poetry and really getting into poetry as a teen and spending afternoons with a friend reading poetry by candlelight and it feels like something about the searching the search for meaning was there it wasn't our family I mean I wasn't not doing what they were doing I was doing something different and eventually I left home and ran away at age 18. And then I came into TM, Transcendental Meditation. And, I, and also, so leaving the church, I actually left the church at 16. There was a thing that happened that I felt I couldn't bear. Um, and that starting to meditate just became absolute seam of meaning for me, whatever form of meditation it is. So it really feels like that part of that takes you to the pure awareness, pure consciousness, which is that love, actually. Mm -hmm. and to focusing was another absolute revelation because it opened up the meditation is somehow, it's not with content, but focusing is spirituality with content. Mm -hmm. and, and because of meaning that open up through implicit intricacy are just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. There was these stages but it always was something about searching for meaning and what is that? And, yeah. and that is a kind of seam that has been with me. Mm. So. Yeah, it's not letting you go. <laughs> not letting me go. <laughs> I'm connecting with Leslie um, when she said the, about the poetry, because I find that writing poetry, especially something really simple like haiku, is a way of getting to just the right word, the right, the right word has the right meaning, and that's all connected with focusing as well. Yeah. You know, just getting that absolute right word is what you know you've hit that. And I love the, her word seam. <laughs> it's like a seam of gold or precious ore or something that. Uh, that we're all looking for and we recognize it when we see it yes yes okay. yeah you. that's beautiful i once did a shakuhachi piece called the uh, gold in the mountain uh, with a couple of other musicians and uh, yeah i really get that it's beautiful seam of gold i just wanted to share jonas first thank you very much for 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 your for sharing your story and and it so resonated with me. And, and the main thing was this innate wanting for that more, for that wisdom, for that. And, and in my case, I, 
as a teenager and as a young person, I was looking for that in all the wrong places. <laughs> and then I was raised a Catholic and then I left the, the Catholic church and then I went back to the church further on in life as an Anglican and I studied theology, but I was always looking for that outside of myself until the, the, uh, it got to a point where I went through very, very, very difficult times in my life. And, and it was then when I went inside and I realized this, when the, what the Bible says, that don't look for the kingdom of God outside of yourselves, it's in, look for it inside. And, and, and that's when everything began to change and I could find that, that, that inner peace, that inner wisdom. And, and then I got into touch with focusing and I said, wow, this is it. <laughs> so it made so much sense, so much sense. Yeah. But we are all, it's like the, the searching for that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, can I say something more? Just a little, I couldn't resist because Lynn, you mentioned Jackie Lewis, and when I was sharing, I wanted to say about this, that this recognition of this light inside us can come through meeting. And she was telling something like this, that uh, Ubuntu people, when they say hello or good morning, they say, I see you. Yeah. And the answer is, I see you. So it was for me so touching and I, I wanted to share. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> you know that, uh, yeah, uh, Jesus, when he was on his way to be uh, executed, he uh, sat with his friends, as you know, and uh, John 14 to 17 is my favorite uh, mystical book of, in the Gospels. And uh, he said to them, um, I be at peace, don't worry, uh, have no, let go of fear, in my language, let go of fear. Um, and um, just know that I'm in you and you are in me and we are in God. No mm -hmm. separation. You know, he was, that's what he wanted to give them. And he said, he also said, what's mine is yours. What's mine is yours. You have everything that that I have. And um, And what do I have? I have a relationship with the creator who he called Abba. Um, so that I, thou uh, relationship for him was fundamental and that's what he wanted to share. And um, I am nothing without, without that relationship. I'm nothing. Um, but it's not a, um, when Marguerite Poirot po po said, I am nothing, she got in trouble for that from the authorities. What she meant was, what some of you have been talking about in, in the meditation experience, um, that we come to a place where we let go of all of our um, everyday identities. You know, I'm a, I'm a clerk, I'm a cook, I'm a, a school bus driver, I, I'm a theologian, I'm all the identities that we have uh, in our everyday life dissolve. And what's left? Nothing. But that nothing is holy. That, that's a holy nothing. And I was reminded of it since we're talking about poetry by, um, I know some of you love Rilke. I certainly love Rilke. Um, and he he wrote this poem, uh, Du Dunkelheit aus der Ich stamme. Uh, you, darkness of whom I am born, I love you more than the flame that limits the world to the circle it illumines and excludes all the rest. But the dark embraces everything, shapes and shadows, creatures and me, people, nations, just as they are. This dark lets me imagine a great presence stirring beside me. I believe in the night. So that's Rilke and um, trusting the darkness uh, of whom I am born. It's so beautiful and loving. He says, I love you more than the flame that limits the world to the circle it illumines and excludes all the rest. That to me is what the ego does. It, it's, it's a flame because it's, it's so bright, it's light. It seems like light, it's consciousness, but it, it can, a consciousness can limit the world and exclude everything else. Um, consciousness can be some, become so focused on 
what we want, what I want, what the ego wants, and excludes everything else. But the dark of whom I am born, the mother darkness, if you will, um, I am free because I'm nothing. I'm free of myself. I'm free of what other people think about me. So <laughs> I used to, this was such a big problem for me that uh, some of you may resonate with this, that, um, you know, I, I grew up in a, with a lot of shame uh, coming from an alcoholic family, a father who abandoned the family and uh, other guys had fathers and I didn't. And, you know, it was just a lot of pain there. Um, and I, uh, I thought that's who I was, was one who is ashamed and, um, and when I start, re when I read Rilke, I realize that, you know, I'm born of the mother who loves me into existence and who has no image. There's no image. Um, some of you grew up with the image of Jesus that uh, Warner Salman painted. Uh, I wish I had brought it with me, but um, I thought that that image that most Christians grew up with in the 40s, 50s, 60s, was a photograph of Jesus, but um, actually it uh, is a painting of someone who had a revelation, uh, a business man named Warner Salmon. And it, what, when I realized that, I realized, wow, there is no image for God. Um, that's why Rilke uses the word darkness. There's no image, but that, that darkness is holy. Um, that darkness gave me life gives us life. I'm wondering if we might want to have a pause and then go into our breakout rooms. It's a quarter after mm -hmm. nine. What do you think, Melinda? What do you think, Jonas? Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like there's a, you know, a moment here when we can just take a couple of breaths and Mm -hmm. take in all that has been said and all that Jonas has given us to chew on, to metabolize, to see what comes in us, to see what this word wisdom means to us. That poem that you read about Don't Go Back to Sleep is a poem my partner and I used to always quote to each other. Oh, really? Uh, up early in the morning. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful poem. It is. It's true. Okay, let's see what, what you have to share. What's behind all these smiles? <laughs> Maybe that's the one thing we shared is happy smiles. Like um, Jonas certainly has a happy smile and it's great to learn from someone who has a happy smile and who has enthusiasm and love inside them. Mm. Um, so that's one thing that came up in our talk, right? <laughs> that's great. Victor, looks like you're about to say something. Me? Yeah. <laughs> <Sit up. laughs> um, no, I, um, I, I just want to share what I shared to Jonas uh, that, you know, I come from uh, an atheistic country, uh, was born and raised and educated atheistic. And uh, uh, to me, like when I hear God, it's like an ax falling. You know, uh. like, <laughs> but it uh, totally does not preclude me from understanding and connecting to- Which country? Uh, uh, I, I was born and raised in in Russia. Ah, yeah. 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 This day, I would like to, these days. I would like to say I'm from Ukraine, you know, but but I'm from from Russia. Yeah. yeah. But I live in New York City. Yes, I, I Victor, I, uh, Victor, and I talked about this a little bit. I, I have friends. Um, uh, from Ukraine, and um, I have one of the empty bell folks is a, was a minister in in Kiev, Lviv, and uh, Moscow, and he's communicating continuously with folks who are in danger or or dead, 
Um, and and it, it's so uh, it's so painful to see how spirituality, religion can be waylaid and hijacked mm -hmm. to to kill uh, to kill, uh, like Margaret. What happened to Marguerite Poet? You know this beautiful woman, and and the the murders are continuous now in Ukraine, as you know, and many of the murderers pray. I don't know if you call that prayer. Um, but I think it's something for all of us to reflect upon about how the spiritual life, no matter what path we're on, can be hijacked by uh, by the dark side and the, the bad dark. <laughs> the bad dark, right? Yeah. There's so many crimes in the name of religion. Yes. It's, 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 it's something I think about constantly. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But I have to say, I just want to add something there. Who who said that? Was that Inji? It's actually Inji. Yes. I um I think it's really important for us to th those of us who have some indication that we recognize wisdom and real love, that that we stay on that path and not get distracted by those who use the path f for bad things. Because I mean, I have friends that get so angry at nationalistic Christians that they become con consumed by their anger. You know I'm, what I'm consumed by anger, sir. Yes. I well, am I consumed by anger by what's done in the name of religion. I totally get and, that. And I can be very specific, but it's very different if it happens to your own family or your brothers or your, I mean, I, I yeah. Yeah, I get that, yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm not at your level, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Listen, I think I think anger is okay. Ang okay. Uh, yeah, anger anger is fine. Um, it's it's how anger how the energy of anger is used. Um, at at the empty bell, I have a oh I didn't bring it with me. I have a statue of Fudo. Uh, Fudo Mu is a um, a fierce figure who stands outside the temples. Usually, there's two Fudos, one on either side of the temple, holding a sword. And there are flames of passion coming up, and mm -hmm. their job is to protect the holiness of the temple, so oh. that so that evil cannot get in the temple. So that is a use of the energy of anger for good. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to let you hurt this person. I'm not going to let you hurt me, mm -hmm. and that takes that kind of fierce energy. You know, it doesn't spirituality can't be being nice all the time. Um, but but we have to be careful that the anger is not used by our ego, because we want to be right, and we or we want to be vindictive ourselves, or we want to uh, take revenge. That that's not a great use of anger, uh, but there is a use for it. Does, I, does does that make sense? Oh, I I I totally make sense. I think it can be used as a gift. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, that that's not my wo brilliant wording. I I think Marshall Rosenberg said that uh, uh, that anger is a gift, and it totally resonates with what you're saying. Yes, yeah. anger can be because it tells you what you need. Yes. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, that there was some little part of me that felt like, well, we need the voices of the people who have experienced. God as an axe, the, the notions of God or angry at religion, we need those voices too. And so I'm so glad that the two of you brought that voice in because we are a microcosm and we, and that, that fills out the picture and the protest and the struggle is part of that picture also. And I think what makes the difference Sometimes when anger is uh, helpful and when anger is destructive is, is our, our listening, you know, and so we're receiving the anger um, and, and bringing it in and holding it tenderly. Yes, yes, terrible. Thing. And I think we have to remember anger is just not hurting or lashing out it's protecting mm. you're protecting someone or something very important and some people need to be protected 
Uh, I love my anger. I want to say it's a it's a wonderful it's a warm bubbly feeling here, oh. actually. It and it's all, also uh, be, with the help of anger, I did some good things which I wouldn't have done. Yes. Anger is a big helper, actually, mm -hmm. to yeah. overcome mm -hmm. to yeah. overcome difficulties and barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, it can I be used destructively, but it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yes. I used to be afraid of my anger and terrified to express anger, but then I was told that the gift of anger is strength. Mm. So it's it's so when I really allow myself to feel it, it brings me strength. It's how I act on it yeah. or on that strength that matters. But the anger itself is a gift to yeah. feel. Yeah, I agree. Thank you kind of passion. I think we're going to need to close now. Uh, and, it's, and it's so hard because this is such a rich, wonderful conversation. I, I wonder, Jonas, if you have a poem to close with. Uh, and uh, thank Before you. Before you close, so could I ask one question? Uh, Jonas mentioned uh, somebody at a temple, Toto, what, what was his name? I want to look for that. Yeah, you can Google that uh, name. It's F-U-D-O, Fudo. Oh, thank you. Okay. The guardian of the temple. Put it in that. <laughs> thank you. I don't know if I can play. Uh, this, is, this is a musical poem, I think. Um, this, this is the, uh, I was trained by uh, in Shakuhachi. This is a oh, piece lovely. of bamboo. And, and there are four holes on the front and, and one on the back. And I took lessons with uh, Yodo, Kur Yodo Kurahashi in Kyoto, Japan, uh, um, for, but mostly living in Cambridge. This is what the music looks like. Uh, so okay. the, the music here is, is in Japan is read uh, from the top down and then oh, okay. you, you go toward the left. Um, but those so, are musical notes. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are musical notes. Uh, so I don't know how to read Western music very well, but this I can, I haven't played this in a while, but I just wondered if you just bring awareness to your breathing while I blow. Um, the uh, This practice is called, that I learned, it was um, played by Buddhist monks for many centuries, and it's called uh, Sui Zen, blowing Zen tradition, to be present in each moment to the breath as it flows flows down the bamboo. I have to warm up this a bit. just heard is a mistake, but it's not a mistake. Um, I'm out of practice, but the breath, the breath, the, the note disappeared, but my breath kept going. And that's something I learned when I, uh, when I've done concerts is if I miss the note, um, just keep going. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, um, when you're in hell, if you find yourself in hell, just keep going.
can't help falling in love with you. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. It's thank so you, Donna, so much. And thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, you. very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank Such you. Such a beautiful yeah. meeting. Um, thank you.